you everybody for coming. Look at that. Hi. Dzień dobry. Good morning. Oh, good to see you. Right on. Thanks for coming, everybody. I appreciate that there's a lot of great choices that you could be making right now. So for you to be here with me today, that makes me so happy. Uh, I'm very grateful that you're here. We're going to try and go through a lot of stuff. That code is not on the screen. Why isn't that on the screen? Hello? Ah, oh, very good. That, the, uh, the Git repository with all that code is there available on that GitHub repository on the, on the slide there. So please grab that for your own edification. If you have questions, comments, feedback, whatever, I'm happy to, to hear from you. I'm on the internet. Uh, so if you have questions there, you can, uh, you can find me. How many of you are on Twitter? Just curious. 2017 Twitter. Twitter. Good stuff. The rest of you, get on it. It's the new IRC. It's a great place to be. It's where all the developers that sort of power the open source that drives your businesses are. And if you want to engage, that's where we hang out, right? Among other places. Um, what about email? How many of you are using email? E email. Anybody? Email. Well, very good. If you're there, we're happy to talk as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to me now. Now that you're all seated and we're all kind of settled in, I need to take care of a very important uh, you know, line of business kind of concern. So if you'll all indulge me, I just need just a couple of seconds of, of your time here. I want you to all say open source and then smile, okay? <sighs> Ready? Steady? Open source! Ah, oh, that's so good. And now you can actually, because of, this is the only time that anybody can ever see the word pivotal on the back of this shirt. I told them not to put it there, but it's there. So, uh, so there's that. Now, a little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I'm very glad to be here. I'm a uh, Spring developer, uh, developer advocate on the Spring team. I'm an open source contributor. I write books. I do my best to speak to audiences. I'm, I've done training videos as well. That's on the uh, online, you know, the O'Reilly Safari marketplace. And I'm working on my latest book, which is so close, finally. I've talked about it for now two years, I think, at this wonderful conference. That book is called Cloud Native Java. It's all about how to build applications that survive and thrive at scale in the cloud. And I can I can see in your eyes, I can see the curiosity. You're, you're wondering about what that bird is. That bird is very important. Anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that it doesn't matter what's in the book. The only thing that matters is the animal <laughs> on the cover, right? That's how you, just, that's, that's how you get the ratings on Amazon. So that, that bird is a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird that is indigenous or native to the Indonesian Java Islands. So it's a bird, and birds, birds fly, often in the clouds. <laughs> and so this is a bird that is native to Java that flies in the clouds. It's a cloud-native Java bird. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a, never mind, it's fine. It's okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, it's okay. So there's that, and, uh, and I work at Pivotal, and at Pivotal we have a lot of great open source, and you may recognize some of the open source on this slide, uh, and we care very much about the open source. It helps us and it helps our community members deliver software safer and better and faster to production, and we care about that actually even more than the software itself. We care about helping organizations and customers and, and our community uh, go faster and safer to production. We understand that a lot of these organizations struggle. They want to go faster, but they, they have uh, a bit of an obstacle. So a lot of organizations today are decomposing their applications into smaller services, smaller microservices. These, ser these microservices make it easier for small teams to deliver software into production. They make it easier for organizations to go faster. And when you move to this architecture, you run into a few uh, sort of architectural complexities, things that you have to address in order to be successful. Now, Spring Cloud and Spring Boot, I think, do a very good job of sort of addressing these concerns at the application level, right? And if you have a, a platform like a Cloud Foundry, that'll help you at the sort of infrastructure and operational level. But one thing that we've seen a, a sort of a growing use for is the ability to move data around these services more efficiently and more scalably. And so organizations have been struggling with this. They want to move data around, but traditional sort of server models, service models, don't exactly uh, meet the, meet the uh, requirement, do they? So what we were looking for is a way to move data around but not waste time blocking on, on server sockets, uh, trying to send data back and forth if we can avoid it. 
And so this isn't a necessarily new idea. It's just that it's become such a very exaggerated concern, such a thing that people care about in the last sort of seven years. And thankfully, uh, Java 4, Java 1.4 in, in 2001 or 2 introduced JDK, uh, J, JDK's NIO, and in the NIO support, we have support for channels and basic support for asynchronous IO. In the last five, six, seven years, we've seen a lot of companies, a lot of organizations in the community uh, develop frameworks that sit on top of this low-level eventing mechanism, the, this low-level asynchronous I.O. Me mechanism. These frameworks provide higher-level operators that let you describe services and systems in terms of event-based or asynchronous uh, sort of events uh, you know, for I.O. So now you can deal with everything in the system using this sort of uniform event-based event API. We've seen organizations like uh, Lightband, which, is which was called TypeSafe before. We've seen organizations like um, Netflix, which of course uh, created RxJava, which uh, was inspired by re research that Microsoft was doing, the Rx extensions for .NET. We've seen, um, at, we saw at, at VMware Spring Source and now Pivotal, we had a project called Reactor. And all, all these, and then of course Vertex at Red Hat, all, all these companies did some really great stuff to sort of find the common, what's wrong? No, mom. Stop it. <laughs> All my friends can see. <laughs> ah. Anyway, um, we've seen We've seen these companies try and find the sort of common ground, all the sort of things that uh, make sense uh, for developers as a sort of consumable API. It has to be high, high level enough to be productive, kind of like the, the JDK Collections uh, API, but it also has to be low level enough that it can be reused everywhere, right? I want to be able to use these types anywhere in my services that I want to return values that may be, for example, long running, that may, that may last a long time, that may produce values uh, indefinitely, right? So what this, this common level of, of, of support is is, is, is this something called the Reactive Streams Initiative. This is something that all these different uh, players in the, in the industry have sort of converged upon. We uh, worked on this together, the people from Red Hat, from Netflix, from uh, TypeSafe, from, uh, or now Lightbend, and, uh, and of course from Pivotal. The Reactive Streams Initiative answers the question for, you know, it, it answers the question, if I want to return a potentially unending stream of values asynchronously. The values may be generated tomorrow, they may be generated in a minute, they may be generated in a microsecond. If I want to return a potentially unlimited stream of values, how do I do that? The JDK doesn't have an easy answer for this right now, right? If you look at the JDK as it stands today, it's easy enough to say, okay, if I have a method that's going to return a single value, maybe T, you know, type T, I return a synchronous T you know, from my method, no problem, that's a string. What if I want to return a, a collection of Ts, a collection of strings? Well here, again, you can use the JDK API for collections, and that's a fairly natural thing to do. We even have support in the JDK now for a single, one single asynchronous value, a completable future. A completable future says, I have a value that I'm going to receive later on. Not right now. All I have is a pointer to something that I can ask for that value later on, or that will tell me when that value is available later on. But we don't have a way of saying, tell me when any of 0 to n values is available. right? That's what's missing, that, that missing thing in the table, well, if you will. You can imagine a table of synchronous and asynchronous and single value versus multiple value. So the Reactive Streams Initiative provides that. It provides something called a, a publisher. The Reactive Streams Initiative is a common sort of de facto specification created by all the different participants in the industry uh, that defines a, uh, four types. The base type, the most important type, is something called a publisher. A publisher is an object that just produces values. It pub produces values that subscribers can then be notified of. When the subscriber subscribes to a publisher, they get a subscription. And there's a, a third type called a processor. A processor is something that both produces a value and it subscribes to a, uh, a publisher. So it's both a publisher and a subscriber. That's it. That's the, very, that's the essence. That, that's the entire Reactive Streams initiative, these four very, very basic types. So that gives us this interoperability. That gives us the ability to talk about this missing thing that's in the JD, that isn't in the JDK. In fact, it's such a useful sort of uh, set of types that the basic support for that is now in JDK 9, in Java Util Concurrent Flow, right? So now we'll have the ability to talk about this, this, this missing thing very soon in a common way. And, and we already have it now with the Reactive Streams Initiative. So the question is, if I have this base type, is that enough? 
Is that of the same level of productivity as, say, the JDK uh, Collections API? And, and I think most would agree that it's not, right? We're missing uh, the ability to compose, to filter, to transform, to do interesting things with these values as though they were a collection, for example. So here is where the opportunity for different part uh, industry participants to, to, uh, to uh, you know, provide a value. With, at Pivotal, we have a project called Reactor. And Reactor is our implementation on top of the Reactive Streams initiative. Reactor works uh, very similar to, for example, RxJava. In fact, the lead of RxJava is a uh, ma main contributor to uh, Reactor, right? So there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of research that gets done and shared across these different projects because we're trying to find the right sort of solution. So what we're going to do today, my friends, is we're going to look at Reactor in the context of building a web application that talks to a database and, if we have enough time, that also has security. The utility of this reactive support is limited by the things we can apply it to. Reactor by itself is awesome, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't solve the problem of how do I build a web service, for example. It doesn't talk, solve the problem of how do I talk to a database. Now, in the Reactor API, we have two specialized types, two specializations. We have a publisher of, that called a mono. A mono is a publisher that produces just one value or zero values. It's still a publisher, it's just it's got this one little constraint. And then we have a flux, F-L-U-X. A flux is a publisher that produces 0 to n values, a potentially unlimited number of values. So keep that in your mind. What we're going to do today is we're going to build a, an application here at start.spring.io. This is my second favorite place on the internet. I'm sure that anybody who, who, who's seen my talks before knows that I love start.spring.io. It's my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place, does anybody know my first favorite place? Production, thank you, exactly. I love production and so should you. You should bring your friends, bring your family, bring the kids. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. If you're not already in production, then you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. If you need inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, start.spring.io. If your children are restless and can't sleep, start.spring.io. And if you suffer from indigestion after a long, long night of alcohol abuse and PHP, start.spring.io. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application. We're looking at some new stuff today. This is not GA stuff. We're going to look at Spring 5, which is due in the summer. We're going to look at Spring Boot 2.0, which is going to be due in December. We're looking at Spring Security 5, Milestone 1, which is due uh, later this year after Spring 5, of course. And we're going to look at Spring Data. All of this is stuff that's sort of milestones at best, right? So I'm going to use start.spring.io. I'm going to choose Spring Boot 2.0. And I'm going to build a new service that's going to, uh, we're going to build a new service that, it, you know, let's say we have a service that manages movies, you know, like a, a bunch of movies on the internet. Right? And what's another word for movies? Well, flicks is another mo word for movies. So I'm thinking we could create a new service that serves movies on the internet, on the net. Maybe we could call it Netflix. I don't know. We, we could do that. So I'm going to call this the Flux Flix service, right? Or for flux sake. So what we're going to do is now is we're going to build a reactive web application. And then we're going to use a data store. And again, it makes it, it's, a lot of, it's very important that you use something that is non-blocking all the way down to the database. Otherwise, you're going to spend time blocking in that layer. And there's no point in trying to get this uh, non-blocking reactivity at the higher layer, layers. All right. All right. That's me reacting. What? OK. That's fine. You're embarrassing me. Thank you. So it's very important to not spend time blocking. And so what we're going to do is we're going to choose a database. Now, you, you have a lot of choices right now. So the, the Spring Data project doesn't su support reactivity where it's not possible. For example, we don't have Spring Data JPA reactive support because the lower levels don't support that yet. Now, there is promising news. Last year at Java 1 in 2016, Oracle talked about, and again, it's just talk at the moment, but you know, knock on wood, maybe in 10 years, uh, they talked about reactive JDBC. 
if they even understand that this is a requirement, then that makes me feel better, right? This is, it means that this is something that the, the community at large should think about. So maybe in a year or 10, I don't know, we'll see uh, reactive JPA in this, uh, you know, in this menu. In the meantime, we have some choices that we can use that are built on the reactive drivers and these native data technologies. So we have a lot of choices here. Um, I'm going to use uh, reactive MongoDB. So again, if you want to lose your data reactively, very quickly, <laughs> reactive MongoDB. If you, don't, if you really don't want to use that data for long, Reactive MongoDB, right? So we're going to go ahead and use that. I'm also going to use Lombok. Now, Lombok is a Java compile time annotation processor. It just makes it easier for me to write some code and not worry about synthesizing all the sort of getters and setters and, and all that, right? So here we are. I'm going to un unzip this uh, file here, go to my directory, idea palm.xml. And what we're going to do is we're going to build an entity uh, that, that talks to the database. You know, we have to do the traditional sort of stuff that you do if you're doing Spring Boot. I'm just curious, how many of you have used Spring Boot? Oh, very good, right on, now we're cooking. So that's uh, the very large majority, which makes me feel better, right? So a lot of this will seem very familiar, and that is by design. You get a lot of the sort of familiarity that you already understand, that you already have, uh, out of the box. There's just some small differences, but it should be very easy to get started. Now, can you see that font in the back, my friends? Yes? Thank you, that's awesome, I love this giant screen. Wow, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build an application that manages entities of type movie. And I'm going to use Spring Data, uh, MongoDB here as a document. I'm going to give it a primary key, a primary key that's a string, and I give it a title, right? So spring, pri private string title. Uh, and we'll give it a document uh, ID, right? And I want to create some getters and setters and some accessor, you know, some constructors and some two strings and all that. So I'll say at data, at no args constructor, at all args constructor. And there we are. There's everything I need to be able to use that. Now, I want to save instances of this, rec of this type into the database. So I'm going to create a repository, right? Extends reactive Mongo repository of type movie whose primary key is of type long. Now again, this is, the very, this is very similar to the support you see in traditional sort of Spring Data Mongo, except that now the return values for all these operations are uh, rea you know, reactor types. There's the mono, there's the, uh, uh, the flux, etc. right? So all these things that we talked about before, they're here. And the contract you can see for a publisher is very simple. It says when somebody subscribes to a subscriber, you know, let them do that, and then you can, uh, you can call the methods on the um, Subscriber. Okay, so now we have this reactive uh, Mongo uh, repository, and we can use that to write some data into the database. So we're going to go ahead and create some um, uh, records into the database just to have something to work with, right? So I'm going to uh, override this method here. It's going to be a Spring Bean that will start up when the application starts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write records to the database, very similar uh, to what we would, would, would have done before, I suppose. And if you've seen my previous talks, you know I like to have some sample data. So let's create some sample records. Our first thing is to write data to the DB, right? So we want to say stream dot of, and we need to create some movie names here. Who can help me think of some movies, right? Uh, we can. I want movie names that are related to, to lambdas, to functional reactive programming, to flux, to monos, to, to reactor in general, et cetera, right? So I can help with uh, some of them. How about silence of the lambdas, huh? 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 What movie had the flux capacitor? Back to the Future, thank you. There's a good one as well. Okay. Oop. You must be able to type to do this. What about. Um, E tu mono tambien. <laughs> In Spanish, mono means monkey. There's a movie called E tu mama tambien, that's, and you mother as well. What about that one? Uh, what about uh, Flux Gordon? Like Flash Gordon? Or Enter the Mono Void? <laughs> what about that? There's an anime that's very popular that has the, uh, the word flux in it. Does anybody here remember that one? It was a movie a few years ago, too. Aeon Flux. Aeon Flux, yep, thank you. There we are. So now we've got a few names. And what I want to do is I want to visit every single one of these and write them to the database, right? So I could do this a couple of ways. I suppose I could do this. I could say for each, uh, and then for each title, I want to write this to the database, like so, right? So save, new movie, and I'm going to pass in a UUID for, this, for the uh, document uh, ID, and then pass in the title. And uh, that looks like it should work, doesn't it? But it, it's probably not going to work. And to appreciate why, you have to realize that this is returning a, a mono. 
So this doesn't do anything until we actually trigger it. Just like the Java Streams API, you actually have to have a terminal sort of method. You have to have a terminal invocation. So I can say subscribe and say that, right? That would be one thing. I'm, here I'm saying I've got a consumer, and I'm passing in the consumer, and the consumer takes a movie. In this case, it's just to take an object. That would certainly work. Let's try running that, OK? So it's going to write each record to the database, and then we'll see the asynchronous log. Hey, there we go. OK, now all we're going to do, because this is MongoDB. MongoDB isn't uh, great at, um, ooh, look at that. Messages, goodbye. OK. Ekill, Slack. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, okay, so we've got this. We've got the data to the database. Uh, what happens if I run it again? Huh? That seems to have worked, but we don't. We're not actually confirming that. You know, we're not actually looking at the state of the database itself, are we? So let's try doing this. Let's say movie repository dot find all dot subscribe, and then let's just print out everything here. And let's see what happens. It'll fail because of the compiler, of course. Uh-oh. Looks like somebody else has been in this database before, right? So we need to de delete the data before uh, we call that code. So let's just say delete all. That should be fine, right? No big deal, right? Of course not. It's not going to work. It's too simple. So I could say block. Right? That would actually stop the, the processing at that line and wait for everything to happen. But what kind of terrible life decisions have I made by doing this? Here I've gone to the reactive API and I'm using block. What do you think my girlfriend would think of me? <laughs> she would not be ha impressed. So instead, I want to subscribe. I want to say that when something is done, I want to run this logic, this runnable complete runner. So I can say, here's a consumer for each item, which of course is void, so there's going to be nothing. I could say, here's a consumer for any exceptions that are thrown. And then I can say, here's a runnable to run at the very end of the body. So I don't need the first two parameters. What I want is that last one. I want to run a runnable. And then do this, right? Put that in there. Good. Now we re rewrite it. And the code should work. Very good. Nice and clean. We've gotten the results. That's dis we just demonstrated a dependent call, one that depends upon the other. Now, I've got data in the database. What I want to do is build an API. So in order to build an API, I want to have a little service that will manage our data for us. right? So let's clean this up a bit here, make it a little bit easier to, to move around. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new service here, a class flux flix service. Okay. And our service is just a Spring service as usual. And I'm going to return, I want to find a, I want to have an endpoint that returns a single movie. So by ID, very good, OK. And I want to have a, an endpoint that returns all of the movies, like this. That seems interesting, so I'll do that as well. And I want to also have another endpoint that returns a never-ending stream of events when people stream videos. Basically, I want to stream all of the activity on the, the Netflix service. I want to stream the streams, basically. I want to cross the streams. So I'm going to say, here's a new endpoint called streams, and it's going to take the movie ID as well, right? Or just ID. But we don't have that type, do we? So let's create a, a DTO here for that. And we don't actually have you know, a million users on the website uh, downloading and watching movies all the time. So I have nothing live that I can log into and do uh, and, and use for this. So what we need to do is we need to create uh, some fake data. right? So let's, let's create a, a DTO here, data at no args constructor, all args constructor. There we go. And I'm going to create a, um, a, a, a fake endpoint. And I'll return a new value you know, artificially. So before we do that, let's implement the rest of these methods. I think those are going to be pretty straightforward. We can use our movie repository, right? There's this. And we go down here and we say, OK, movie repository dot find all. Very good. Movie repository dot find by ID. Et voila. OK, so we're, we're already done with that. Now let's do this last one. What I want to do is I want to say every second, create a new value. So here I can use some of the nice composition operators inside of the Flux API, inside of Reactor. Uh, and so I want to say is I want to say Flux interval. So for every, every second, 
I want to create a new value. And what's going to happen is it's going to create, it's a stream of values that will that'll never end. It'll create a new one every second. But in between that second, it doesn't block. It's not keeping open uh, any sort of activity. And we could, you know, this gives us a mental model for how to, how to think about any kind of fluxes. In theory, in between the, the, the results and the values, there's no reason we have to block. So I've got now a flux that will produce a never-ending stream of values. And what I want to do is also generate a... Um, a, uh, a new movie event, an artificial, you know, just a new movie event. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, create a new stream and just create a new movie event, right? I'm just, you know, having a little example here. And I need the movie, don't I? I need this movie based on this ID. So I need that. We'll have to come back to that. We'll have to actually find that record in a second. And we'll say movie. And we'll create a new date. Okay. So there's two streams. And what I want to do is I want to say, Every time there's a new value in the flux for interval on the left, take a new value from the movie event thing on the right. So I'm going to do it in lockstep, one by one by one. That's called zipping the, st the, uh, the fluxes or the, the publisher. So I can say flux.zip interval. And I want to take this value here. And I get now a zipped flux that, ha that is the composite of both of those. So now I can say, let's just go ahead and map that flux, the zip flux, map it from tuple 2 to get t2, right? And then we, we can return that. So that actually does what I want. I'm saying unpack the value. So for every time there's a new value, unpack it, create a new flux, and return just the movie event. But we still have to solve this problem, right? So this isn't so bad. We can just say by id, id dot subscribe, and then we're given the movie and we can do our logic here. So what I want to do is actually take that re value and return it, though, right, as a flux. So that's not going to work. I need to say flat map many instead. And I can put all of this here in that code. Et voila. OK? So I'm taking two, zip, two fluxes, two publishers. I'm zipping them together. I am creating a new one out of that using the composition operators. And then I'm using one uh, one publisher to get the movie and then create a dependent call that returns a flux of potentially many values. Okay, So there we go. There's our stream API, our little service API. Now we can do what I wanted to do, which is to build a REST API. Now this is going to seem very familiar if you've ever used Spring MVC, but we're not using Spring MVC. We're actually using something called Spring WebFlux. Spring WebFlux is a reactive runtime that we built in Spring 5. It's based on Netty. Right? So you're no, you'll see here, I'm actually starting Netty here. This isn't Apache Tomcat or Jetty or, or uh, Undertow, for example. Uh, you can run the Spring WebFlux API on a traditional servlet 3.1 uh, implementation, but it's not going to be fully reactive. That's by definition. The, the servlet API is not reactive, so you're going to get degraded functionality and degraded performance. It's an option. I just don't recommend it. Right? We have this nice Netty-based runtime. It's, it's lightning fast. So let's build a, a uh, FluxFlix REST controller. And in my REST controller, I'm going to create a endpoint here, at rest controller. I'm going to map this whole thing to uh, movies. Whoops, movies. OK. And we're going to say public uh, movie, sorry, public flux of movie all. OK, that's one endpoint. That looks very similar to the service that we just built. Public uh, mono of movie by ID, again, very similar. Right? And we want to create a, uh, an endpoint that just returns all of the movie events. Right? So streams. There we are. So now there's three endpoints here. And what I want to do is I'm going to map them, you know, same as before. So here's all of them. I'm just going to map this one to forward slash movies. This one will be mapped to um, movies, movie ID, streams, right? which means I need to create a path variable, don't I? So at path variable string movie ID. Uh, and then this one needs to just return movies, movie ID. Oops, movie ID. Very good. So there's this. Same thing as before, string movie ID. There's our parameters. Now we can use the FluxFlix service that we've just created to write this code, to, to make short work of this code. Right? So there it is in the constructor. For the first one, we just say FluxFlix service dot all. That'll work. For the second one, we want to say flux, flux service dot, uh, streams passing in the movie ID. Now, of course, this isn't going to work, is it? It's a, it's a REST endpoint. I'm not going to just do JSON here. I want to send, send a potentially unlimited stream of data. 
So we can use other protocols here. We can use, for example, WebSockets. WebSockets is a bi-directional protocol, and we could say, I want to send, I want to deliver, I want to push values when they're available, potentially unlimited values. That's one way to go. We could also, in this case, since we're just pushing values, it's not bi-directional, we can use server send events. Right? Server sent events is unidirectional. It's from server to the client. So here, instead of just returning JSON, I want to say that this is a server sent event endpoint. Okay? I'm producing that. Before, if you've, had, if you've used Spring MVC, because it was built on the serverlet API, we had to do some gymnastics to make it possible to return a potentially unlimited sort of sequence of values. And so it wasn't as simple as saying, here's a type that I already know how to use just reuse that and do the right thing in this case with the uh, content negotiation, right? Flexflix service by ID, again, fairly straightforward. So if we run this, I think we should have now uh, three endpoints. Let's confirm it. Okay. Come on. Jeez. Okay, curl. Curl. HTTP local host 8080 movies. Whoops. JSON PP. Okay, not bad. Not bad. There's that. Let's get one of the movies. Silence of the Lambdas here. Okay. Curl. HTTP local host 8080 movies. This one. Did that not work? Double movies. Oh, I have, oh, awkward. Oh, yes. Thank you, my, my mob programmers. Okay. Too smart by half I am. Okay, we, we try again, okay? This time, I'm rooting for us. Okay, there's our movies. Grab this one here. Curl, HTTP, localhost, 8080, movies. There's that one. And we said we have an endpoint called streams. And if we just sit back and relax, we can see the events. People are watching the videos or watching the movies at random times. Well, in this case, it's not random. But you can see it. it's producing these uh, service and events for us. Not bad. Not bad. We have the easy ability to now move between these sort of synchronous blocking sort of technologies like REST and move between this sort of asynchronous thing like service and events. And it's the same, you know, mentally, we're thinking about the same thing. We've just got fluxes. We've got publishers, really. We've got fluxes and monos, uh, which are publishers. This is one way to build our REST API. But one nice feature in Spring 5 that I really quite like is this new thing called functional reactive endpoints. This is very similar to uh, Sinatra in the Ruby on Rails world, or uh, Scalatra in the Scala world, or um, or Spark Job. I mean, a lot of other APIs have similar things. Uh, and so I'm very happy to see it uh, in the Spring ecosystem. So the way that works, I guess we can just do it up here. The way that works is we say, functional reactive configuration. Sure, I'll create a configuration class. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a bean of type router function, right? Oh, router function routes. And I need to inject this FluxFlix service here. And my job is to return a route definition. So I'm going to say, when somebody calls movies, call this new handler function. <clears throat> it's a callback. But I don't want to have all this logic right next to the route. So what I like to do is I like to create a component that handles it. So I'll call this the route handler. Right? So this is just a regular spring bean. And I'm going to have the, uh, the equivalent definition that I have here, Ser mono server response handle server request. right? And this one will handle all of them. And we'll have one for the streams and one for by ID. right? So by ID, streams. There we go. Now we can use our, our, our service, which we carefully wrote as a separate thing for now, I hope, obvious reasons. And we use most of that logic, right? So our job here is to say server response dot OK dot body. And the body in this case is just going to be uh, I don't know, the movies, right? All of them. So we're going to say flux flux service dot all movie dot class. There we are. So what I'm doing is I'm telling the, 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 the runtime, here's a collection of something. And it's coming from this publisher here. And it'll do, con it'll do the HTTP message conversion on the back end there, and it'll turn it into what we want. Um, in this one, I want to do slightly more complicated. I want to say server response dot OK dot body, and then flux flux service dot by ID. And I have to get that path variable somewhere, don't I? So by ID, or sorry, path variable movie 
ID, and then we just say, here's a collection of movies, right? Just like before. Is that the right one? Okay, that, that's slightly more complicated, but it works as well. And finally, for this one, this one's a little bit more complicated still. Same basic structure, same basic arrangement. We're going to say, get the server ID from the, uh, or the movie ID from the, the path variable. But we also want to uh, change it to a content type of service and event, right? Media type, text stream event. And then here, we're sending back movie events, right? So we have to say stream streams, okay? Now, now we've got these router functions, we can delegate to them instead of encoding them or, you know, hard, uh, writing them right there. So let's inject our router service, our, our route handler, right? There's our route handler. Yeah, route handler. Okay, and we can say route handler all. And we want to create a new route. We want to say request predicates dot get movies, movie ID. This will return route handler by ID. And we'll create another route, request predicates dot get movies, movie ID streams, okay? Route handler streams. Very good. So that's the basic arrangement. That's the same thing. I had to, uh, you know, you can do one or the other at the moment. Uh, you know, it's a little, uh, it's sort of, you can choose functional reactive endpoints, you can use the REST controller. I disabled this so that I can use this. Okay, so let's see if everything is working as it did before. So we go to movies. There we are. That looks like it's okay. Good. Let's get silence of the lambdas. Okay. We say, want to call this endpoint here. There's our single record. Let's get the streams. Hey, not bad, huh? Good stuff. Very good. So now we've got that. Now, I want to build a client to talk to the service, right? I've got a, an API that produces REST APIs and service end events. I want to build a client to talk to it. So I'm going to go back to the Spring Initializer, my second favorite place on the internet. And I'm going to build the FlexFlix client, or FFC. And I'm going to use Spring Boot 2.0 again as well. We're going to build a reactive uh, reactive web application, a reactive Mongo, uh, sorry, we're going to use Lombok, we're not going to use Mongo, we don't need to. And I'm going to build a client and open this up. So, cd downloads unzip ffc.zip, cd ffc idea palm.xml, take some water, wait for it to boot. Oh, that's good stuff. Open source water. Very good. So, I need to start this on a separate port. I don't want it to run on the same port as my other one, right? So, 8081. And I need to create a, a client to talk to the API. Now, in the, in, the, in the Spring Framework, we have the REST template. The REST template is a synchronous uh, sort of HTTP client. And it works well. It's sort of the workhorse of the HTTP message client world in, in Spring. But uh, for, the, for the Spring WebFlux API, we took a different approach. We have a builder API called WebClient, which we're going to use here. And WebClient is reactive, right? It, it is meant to do the right thing if it, if it can possibly pass evade it well, right? So here, we're going to uh, create a bean that just uses the WebClient. We're going to call our service, our, our movie service, our FlexFlex service. So we're going to say return args and return some data. And uh, we're going to say get URI, HTTP, localhost, 8080, forward slash movies, right? And what I need to do is to say, make the request, and then I have to take the results that come back. I have a, a stream of client responses, and I need to turn those values into a body. So I need to tell it what to do. Remember, we don't want to have, we don't want to assume that we can just load everything to the end of the file and then convert it. That's not, that's the way the HTTP message converters in the REST template would have worked, but here, we're dealing with reactive a APIs. This, this REST API may have a billion records. So we need to give our client clues about where it can stop to do some data framing, give us a result, and then keep processing. Right? So here we're saying, I want to take the body that's coming back and frame it as a bunch of movies. So I need to have that type on the class path here. So I'll just grab this movie lazily. Copy and paste is a terrible idea. Don't, ever do, don't do as I'm doing. Okay, and I'll, I need the DTO for our movie event. Okay. So now, we, there we go. We've got our DTOs. And what I want to do is I want to say, when I get a, a collection of movies back, I want to filter it. 
I want to say filter. And I want to say for each movie that has a title of, which one? Silence of the Lambs does. Okay. For each one of those that has this, give me the response. And then I'm going to subscribe and just print out everything that we see, just to see if this is working as we expect it to, to. Okay. So there's this. Let's see if that works. And if that works, then we'll go ahead and try and do the uh, SSE server side events or server sent events. Okay. There's that one movie. It's on the console. That seems to have worked. Let's go ahead and now use this subscription to then get the, uh, the stream, right? So we're going to say client.get.uri HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash movies forward slash movie dot dot get ID streams, okay? Dot exchange dot subscribe cr cr dot body to flux movie event dot class and uh, and there we are. So now we're going to subscribe and visit every single one that comes back. Again, just printing out the values. And this should be the actual um, the uh, service and events at this point, right? So I'm, I'm using a dependent call here, one calling the other. So here we go. Stop and restart. Hey, there we go. So we've got a service that is now capably getting streaming all the values back as it can. Now, we have a full 10 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and try something that just got released yesterday, or actually very, very recently, a couple days ago. Uh, we're going to go ahead and secure our application. So, so far, we've built an application that um, is reactive from the web server all the way down to the data store, and then, uh, you know, everything, everything's non-blocking so far. But again, in a real application, you're going to have security. And what's the point of security if you end up sitting there on a thread local waiting for a principal to come back uh, blocking, right? You don't want to lose reactivity anywhere in the API. So what we're going to do is we're going to now use the Spring Security 5 milestone uh, to, uh, to um, secure our service here, OK? So in order to do that, I need to bring in Spring Security. And I'll say Spring Security Core. And we're going to bring in Spring Security Config. And Spring Security Webflex. Okay, this is the new module in Spring Security Five. And what I want to do is I want to secure access to my application. So I'm going to create a security configuration. This, yeah, that's gone. Create a new security configuration. We'll annotate it with that configuration. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bean of type Web Filter. Right? This is the sec Spring Security filter chain, but for the Spring WebFlex world. And in order to do that, I'm going to use hpsecurity.http. This is my uh, sort of callback. And then I can say http.http basic. I want to enable HTTP basic. HTTP basic dot, um, authorization or authentication manager. And what it's expecting is a reactive authentication manager. Now, in, in Spring Security, you have this concept of an authentication manager. The authentication manager is the root object in Spring Security. It doesn't care about how you tell it about the uh, incoming requests principle. It doesn't care if that is a token or username and password or a certificate or whatever, right? So uh, what we want to do is to use our authentication manager to answer the question, who's making the request? Is that person who she or he says she or he is, right? So let's uh, uh, add a reactive authentication manager. OK. And I don't want to set up, you know, Spring Security can talk to anything. You can use LDAP or SAML or Kerberos or Active Directory or whatever, right? But I don't want to set all that up. So I'm just going to create a simple um, uh, reactive, uh, sorry, simple, which one? Reactive authentication manager repository. Reactive Authentication Manager Repository Reactive. Uh oh. Time to cheat. Just in case. Always have a backup plan. Okay. Whoa. So reactive it killed itself. Audible relief. Right. User details repository authentication manager. I knew that. I was just testing you. So, so there's that. User details 
reactive or repository authentication manager, and this in turn uh, takes a you know return new. This in turn takes a user details repository. So again, a lot of this will be auto configured for you when you have Spring Boot and Spring Security uh, working together. But right now we're doing things a little bit low level. So what this is expecting is a user details repository bean. And again, this is sort of like the user detail service that you would have used in Spring Security, you know, the blocking Spring Security. Uh, so this is expecting a, given a username, it wants a, it wants a mono of user details, which is the object that it will be used for the authentication, the, the principle. So we can inject that here, user details. Well, actually, at this point, it doesn't matter. There we go. And we'll come back and implement that user details uh, repository in a second. But for our purposes, we know that we can use the reactive uh, authentication manager for that. And then we need to also create a uh, authorization exchange, ant matcher. I want to say anything under forward slash should be allowed to go through if it meets the the, the, the access control limitation that we specify. Normally, we would say, OK, only the users with this role or, this, or this, uh, you know, this property. We could also use Spring expression language to make some more dynamic decisions. But here, now, since Spring, fr Spring 5 is Java 8 or better, and all the things that build on Spring 5, by definition, are also Java 8 or better, we can now use lambdas. So here's an opportunity to dynamically say, I want to, whenever I have an, a request come in, answer the question about whether this user can make the request using a lambda. And what I, what I get here is two opportunities. I get an opportunity to say auth, auth.map, and then I get the authentication. And when I have the authentication, I want to ask, what are your authorities? What you know, rights or permissions or scopes or roles do you have? And I want to say any match, or sorry, stream dot any match, ga, ga dot get authority dot equals admin, right? And I'm going to collect all that uh, into a list. Oops. Off map. Uh, OK. Map this to a uh, bool new authorization decision passing in bool, right? And we can use a lambda, we can use a method reference for that as well. So now we have HTTP basic, we've locked that endpoint unless it's, you know, unless it meets that test. We're going to tell it to use our reactive user details repository. And in order to do that, we're going to just create a very simple sort of database here. We're going to create a little in memory database of list of, uh, of usernames and uh, roles, right? So here we are, new hash map, or I suppose we could use a concurrent hash map. OK. And we're going to say users.put jlong arrays dot as list admin user, OK, and I'll say uh, R winch. Actually, I don't get to be admin. Let's use Rob Winch here, R winch. And there's user admin. And what I'm going to say is return mono dot just or empty. So I'm going to either return an empty mono or the value that I find from users dot get username. Uh, I'm going to map it. If it's there, then, then I can map it. So I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to ignore the return value since it'll give me the roles. I'm going to use the username again to um, create a new user, which, can, you know, which is based on the username and that has the password from the users. Uh, we're just going to assume that every user has a password password. Uh, and then I'm going to use the user's database to get the, uh, the roles using the username as the key. Um, and then that should do it, right? Collect. Oh, and then I need to map this to a collection of uh, granted authorities, right? So new simple granted authority, passing in R. OK, collect that to a list. That's the contract here. And then we can use a method reference here as well. OK. Simple, right? 
I'm kind of kidding. This gets easier when, when the, when the uh, Spring Boot stuff is there, right? So that'll, that'll be fine. But for now, we're just doing low-level Spring Security, which, if you've ever used Spring Security, uh, you know, it's very, very powerful, but it has a lot of options. And so this, the fact that I can do this in just three beans is pretty darned awesome. So let's go ahead and run that. And uh, what am I doing wrong here? Oh, right. HTTP basic, return HTTP.build. OK. Now, let's see what happens. So if I call curl HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash movies minus V unauthenticated, let's say minus U jlong password. Uh, 403 forbidden. Wait a minute. When in doubt, cheat. This one. Oh, thank you. Right, R winch. There we go. Very good. So, today, my friends, we've looked ever so briefly at some of the support inside of Spring and the Spring ecosystem for building reactive web applications. What's important here is that it should, A, seem pretty familiar, but also you should see the possibility here, right? We have this really composable runtime at the low level. It's integrated throughout, right? So Spring 5 is the very beginning of the journey. We have in Spring Security and Spring Data preliminary reactive support. We're going to have in Spring Cloud the, uh, the support for uh, new technologies like Spring Cloud Gateway, which is a microproxy based on on the reactive support in Spring itself. Now, all of this will culminate in Spring Boot uh, one dot, uh, sorry, in 2.0 at the end of the year, and then Spring Cloud, which will be next year, right? So early next year. So with that, my friends, I hope you can see the opportunities. I hope you uh, got something out of this. I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, I uh, really appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> now, it is a... Uh, there are some great, uh, there are some other great talks here at at, uh, at GCon that I encourage you to go to. My friend Marcin is giving a talk. Um, when is it, buddy? Two hours. Two hours from now. Go see that one. Thank you.